I made a TikTok briefly covering the ABGs a while ago and I was actually really surprised at how many people were unfamiliar with this look. I know it had a moment online a while ago but the history of the term goes back way further. So ABG stands for Asian Baby Girl or originally Asian Baby Gangster and ABG the aesthetic as it is known now is more of a curation of elements that are popular among Asian American girls who like to party. This includes bleached or dyed hair, heavy lashes, tattoos with Asian motifs, Instagram brows, tight black clubbing clothes, done up nails, etc. etc. And these are just the fashion and beauty elements. Other things include activities like drinking lots of boba, going to EDC and raves, Hennessy as liquor of choice, maybe an expensive car, and brand name bags as well. ABG as an aesthetic became popular a couple years ago when a lot of Asian beauty influencers started doing makeover videos transforming themselves into ABGs and they're actually pretty entertaining to watch. Like most good transformation videos, they usually start off like they just rolled out of bed wearing pajamas and then they transform into this extra done up look. It's the classic good girl to bad girl arc which is what makes it so interesting to watch. And I could definitely see why the look is so popular among a lot of young Asian women and not just influencers because it's sexy but in a tough way which directly goes against the larger Asian stereotype of being a quiet submissive model minority. But the origins of the ABG goes a lot deeper than what you might think. The term came from Southeast Asian gangster girls, mostly from the 90s. They were primarily active around the Bay Area, LA, and OC on the West Coast, and New York in the East Coast, cities where Asian immigrant populations were really concentrated. Of course, there were people who were not gangsters or gang affiliated who donned this look too, but it was very much rooted into gang culture in the 80s and 90s, and it definitely wasn't a look that I would see on TV because there are just no Asians there anyway, but if there were, they were definitely not like this. So when I saw the ABG aesthetic morph into this fun, wholesome makeover trend, I thought it was funny, but I also felt that this style has evolved so much throughout the decades. But if we really want to dig deep into the history of the ABGs, we have to look back at the political state of affairs in Asia during the mid-century. World War II ended in 1945, but this was just the beginning of political and economic turmoil in Asia. The Chinese Communist Revolution ended in 1949, and the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the U.S. was starting to brew during this time as well. In 1950, the Korean War began when the North, which was backed by Russia, invaded the South, backed by the U.S., basically acting as a proxy war between these two giants and their ideologies. Five years later, in 1955, the Vietnam War broke out between the North, supported by Russia and China, and the South, supported by the US, and like the Korean War, the Vietnam War is also considered to be a proxy war between Cold War era forces. The conflict eventually spilled over to Laos and Cambodia as well, which broke out into civil wars of their own. Yeah, Asia was not having a good time during this era. The Vietnam War and their neighboring conflicts lasted for almost 20 years and millions of people died including many many civilians. It was a crisis to say the least and this is what led to the mass immigration of Asian refugees coming into the US during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Many of these immigrants settled in the West Coast region of the US with high populations in California. And because most of these immigrants were literally fleeing from war, most came with nothing and had to rebuild their lives from scratch. 
Many were suffering from PTSD and depression from the war, but they also faced poverty and economic hardships in the U.S. on top of the language and cultural barriers that came with immigrating to a foreign country. Many refugees ended up settling in low-income neighborhoods with large African-American and Latino populations, and this is where the ABG look started to take shape. During this time, Southeast Asian gangs started to form throughout California, mostly with Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laos, and Filipino members, alongside some Chinese gangs that formed a bit earlier as well. Asian American gang activity is not something that's well documented or well known outside of these communities, but the 80s and 90s were a time when it really started escalating in the West Coast. And gang documentation usually focuses solely on men, but there were also women who formed gangs or were gang affiliated through their boyfriends, friends, or family members. But when it comes to the original ABGs, they were basically Southeast Asian girls who lived in these black and brown communities and started adopting their looks. Of course, the mainstream beauty trends of the 90s like the thin brows influenced the look too, but it was definitely merged with the popular local style as well. I can't really say if there are any specific items of clothing or makeup looks that absolutely defines the original ABGs, but I think the main difference can be seen as the original giving more don't fuck with me vibes versus the new version that's giving more I'm really hot vibes. The ABG look was inspired by the Chicanas and African American women who were living in these low-income neighborhoods before the majority of the Asian immigrants arrived in the 80s. The distinguishing elements of this style is rooted in the specific region of the West Coast more so than anywhere else, and it didn't really align with mainstream fashion and beauty trends, which tends to lean towards more Eurocentric beauty standards. There's also been some discussion about cultural appropriation of black and brown styles when it comes to this look, but I don't necessarily think it's the same thing as appropriation, at least when it comes to the original ABGs, because these girls weren't living in rich neighborhoods and copying off the street style to profit off of it or to look cool without any context. I think this is more similar to what cultural assimilation and diffusion looks like because these girls were going to the same schools, they were living in the same neighborhoods, and they were experiencing the same socioeconomic hardships as their black and brown neighbors. Of course, these ethnic groups all have their own unique markers and history, but it's inevitable that some cultural diffusion happens when they're your neighbors, your friends, your boyfriends, or even rivals. And this is where the conversation can get a little tricky because Americans tend to see society along racial lines way more than they do socioeconomic lines. So people tend to forget that class is inextricably linked to what your life is going to be like and who you have shared experiences with, sometimes even more so than race. Which is why you have poor white people who have lived in poverty all their lives but can't see that they have much more in common with POCs who also live in low-income neighborhoods but in urban areas than they do with white billionaires who buy bird apps. It's not necessarily all the people's fault because that's how a nation built on white supremacy is kind of supposed to operate, where you create racial lines among people so they forget where the actual money and the actual power lies. Of course, there were racial tensions between different ethnic groups, especially because it's concerning gang activity. But when you look at the larger picture within a regional and socioeconomic lens, these communities had a lot more in common with each other than not. But when it comes to actual appropriation, many Southeast Asian women have called out East Asian women for appropriating this look, and there are many layers to this issue. 
first, there's an ethnic aspect to it because most of the gangs around that time were of Southeast Asian descent, with the exception of some Chinese gangs that were pretty prominent too, at least around the East Coast and the West Coast, but they do have different roots. Of course, no demographic is a monolith, and we're talking about the West Coast where there is a very diverse Asian population. So there were lots of East Asians who also lived in low-income neighborhoods who adopted this ABG look because of their proximities to black and brown neighborhoods as well. And I also think it's good to mention that this ABG style was not just seen as a quote-unquote gangster look per se, but it was also seen as more American within Asian American communities. And many Asian American girls took on this bolder style, which is very different from mainstream beauty standards in Asia, even back in the 90s, in order to distance themselves from more recent immigrants who they considered to be more culturally tied to the old country and more foreign than they were. It was a way to show that you are American and that you belong here, which I think it's a very Asian American problem with all our perpetual foreignness. But Asian American representation barely exists in the US at all, and within that already tiny amount, Southeast Asian representation is almost non-existent. But because East Asians are the dominant faces of Asian American representation, it's understandable that Southeast Asian women are frustrated at another form of erasure, especially when the ABG aesthetic is now seen as this attractive, sexy formula that stemmed from Southeast Asian women but it's all East Asian girls when you look up ABGs online. On top of that, the colorism and the classism that's been directed towards Southeast Asians from East Asians has had a long, long history. Colorism is rampant across Asia, which is historically rooted in classism, but it's been amplified within more modern times with Eurocentrism coming into the mix. Colorism is widespread even domestically within so many countries in Asia where pale skin is often considered to be the ideal over darker skin tones, even of the same nationality. Your skin tone was associated with class where pale skin signified wealth and being indoors, while darker skin tones signified outdoor labor and the working class or the non-aristocratic. This type of discrimination extended beyond borders where East Asians often discriminated upon Southeast Asians for their darker skin tones and their country's lower socioeconomic status. It's not to say that East Asia was always wealthy because countries like China and Korea also experienced extreme poverty and went through cycles of famine as a byproduct of multiple wars and authoritarian regimes that devastated these nations within relatively recent history. But they experienced a massive economic growth within the past few decades, which really changed their global reach in terms of soft power. However, even among East Asian countries, there's been numerous conversations about how Japanese or Korean pop culture is often more popular and liked by Western audiences compared to Chinese pop culture that doesn't have as much reach in the West. I think the discrimination and the bigotry that exists within the Asian demographic is not as well known to non-Asians as much because the West tends to lump every Asian ethnicity into one gigantic group. So most people are not as aware or informed about the historical tensions that existed within the continent for a very, very long time. There are some benefits to being lumped into this gigantic group because I think a lot of Asian Americans feel solidarity with other Asian ethnicities regardless of their historical tensions within their ancestral countries because of the looming cloud of white supremacy and racism that covers all of us in the West. But even with this pan-Asian solidarity, the erasure of Southeast Asians within Asian American representation is a very prominent problem that many East Asians tend to overlook. B 
beyond the colorism, there are also generational and socioeconomic divisions. The Asian demographic that immigrated more recently are a much wealthier group than the immigrants who came in in the previous decades. Although the model minority myth has been widespread since the mid-century, where the Asian American demographic was portrayed as a very well-educated group coming from mostly upper middle class households, this image of this extremely privileged group has managed to completely overshadow and erase the stories of the people who came to flee from war, dictatorships, famine, and even genocide. However, because of the economic growth that many East Asian countries have experienced since then, the Asian American group that entered the U.S. more recently has become wealthier and more privileged than ever before. So when you see an upper middle class East Asian suburban girl who goes to UC Berkeley do an ABG makeover, it can feel rather disingenuous to people who are aware of its roots. Which is why I don't even necessarily think it's just the East Asian girls who can gentrify this ABG aesthetic. I think it's anybody from a relatively wealthy background who are so far removed from this world that the original ABG girls came from. But I also think this is kind of a generational thing as well because many of the teens and young women who popularize ABG as an aesthetic online didn't really grow up at a time when Asian American gang activity was a real scary thing in some places and they might just not be aware of its history because it's just beyond their lifetimes. Now, I want to be clear that I personally don't have any issues with anybody embracing the ABG look because fashion and beauty trends come and go all the time and people build on existing styles from the past all the time. And we are living in a period where anything and everything can turn into an aesthetic, so I just don't think it runs that deep. And I also don't feel like this particular aesthetic is something that people use like a disposable costume. I think there's more people who embrace this aesthetic because it really is just their personal style and what they like. Plus, the original ABGs are probably like middle age now and they're in their 40s and 50s, they're moms and... I just don't think that they'll be too concerned about micro beauty trends online as much as people make it out to be. But regardless, as with any kind of aesthetic, I still think it's good to give credit and to be at least a little aware of the history of whatever you're taking inspiration from especially when they originated from marginalized groups whose voices were historically oppressed. Thanks for watching and I think my next video is going to be on Korean beauty and the industry behind that. So stay tuned and please subscribe for more.